Okay. Okay, so let's start. So in the last lecture, we were looking at Angloim's Elster algorithm for DFA learning to learn a DFA. And what is the idea? So sometimes if you are given a language, then to construct a DFA may not be super easy. So sometimes you uh, think of that you can kind of have an interaction between a teacher and a learner and the teacher gives you some counter examples and you have a series of steps, series of intermediate DFAs through which you are going to learn the final DFA. And also what does it, uh, what does it guarantee that the DFA that you are going to learn, it's a minimal state DFA, right? So you keep on adding state, you keep on refining the DFA until you finally get the DFA with the minimal number of steps, accepting the language, right? And we also saw the algorithm. How does the algorithm work? So you have, you start with a set of states Q and it's also a set of strings. You start with a set of strings Q. So initially this is initialized to empty. The empty, uh, uh, the empty string, the set, the set containing only the empty string. And you also have a set of test strings, right? Which was also initialized to this set of set containing only the empty string. And what do we do? Then we add elements to this set Q such that Q remains separable and it is closed with respect to T. So you recall what was the definition of separable? So let's try to see, it should be here. So we say that Q is separable with respect to this test set T, if the elements of Q are pairwise distinguishable with respect to T, right? So which means that for all Q, Q prime, such that Q is not equal to Q prime, <coughs> We have that Q cannot be T equivalent to Q prime. So that was the definition of separability and the definition of closed with respect to T is that if for all Q belonging to this capital Q for every string in this set and for every element in the alphabet sigma, there exists some Q prime. Okay, there exists some Q prime belonging to this set. Uh, sorry, I think there is a typo here. Right, so there exists a Q prime belonging to this capital Q such that QA is T equivalent to Q prime. So this is the notion of closure of Q with respect to the test set T. Okay, and now we said that given the Q and the T, you make Q closed with respect to T. Okay, you make it closed. We are going to see an example, it will be clearer. And then once you have that, you can get a hypothesis automaton. You can get a hypothesis automaton and you perform an equivalence query. So the learner is going to perform an equivalence query and send a query to the teacher. So what is that query? So is this hypothesis automaton H equivalent to the desired deterministic automaton that you were looking for, which accepts the same language. Now, if it is the case that this hypothesis automaton H does not exactly accept the language L that you were looking for, then the teacher answers no with a counter example. You obtain a 
counter example on the other hand if the teacher says yes which means that the hypothesis automaton is the same as the automaton that you were looking for which is the automaton accepting the language l then the procedure terminates you have already obtained the automaton that you are looking for which is the hypothesis automaton in this case otherwise the teacher answers no and then you apply lemma 1 to expand q and t so what was lemma 1 So you recall that given a hypothesis DFA, where Q is closed with respect to T, and a counter example. So the teacher provides a counter example. If the answer is no, then you can find strings Q and T, right? So where you can augment this Q to this set Q, and the string T to the test set T, such that Q remains separable with respect to Q union Q is separable with T union T, correct? So this is what we saw. What was the and what was the proof? The proof here was like if you recall, epsilon was correct, but Q M was not correct, and Q M was the state that you would reach from Q zero by reading the word. Okay, the word is of length M W equal to W one to W M. So of course there. So we said when it is correct when if you A state Q i is correct if Q i appended with this W i plus one to W m belongs to L if and only if the word W belongs to L, right? So we know, define the notion of correctness. We say that uh, Q the epsilon state, which is the initial state Q zero, that is correct, whereas the state Q m is not correct because it's a fine, it's a counter example, which meant that there exists some i such that. Q i minus one is correct, but Q i is incorrect, and that helped us uh, giving the strings Q and T such that Q union Q remains separable is separable with respect to T union. T. Okay, right. So we looked at all these things, uh, and then we also. on um, this the other lemma which is if q is separable with respect to t it is possible to add finitely many strings to q resulting in a set q prime that is closed right and so if it is separable but suppose q is not closed with respect to t capital t then you can add finitely many strings so that q prime the resultant set which is q prime it is closed and separable with respect to t so we also saw this lemma Right, the finiteness essentially came from the fact that the number of classes, uh, the number of strings that you would have in this Q prime, it is bounded above by the number of equivalence classes of the indistinguishability relation. Okay, and in fact, the number of indistinguishability uh, classes in the indistinguishability relation was uh, actually higher than the number of classes uh, that you would have in this. Uh, in this relation correct okay so uh so if the teacher answers no then also gives a counter example you can expand q and t and you can have such a separable pair q prime t prime you expand and then again you add elements to q such that add more strings to q such that it becomes closed Okay, so this was the algorithm, the Anglian's L-star algorithm that we saw, and now we are going to look at an example. So this is the example that we said we would. Uh, I mean, this is one example. I mean, of course, you can do it for any regular language. You can run the algorithm in order to learn the DFA. Now, this is one specific example that we are going to look at today. so what is this example the third character from the end must be a one and our alphabet sigma is 0 comma 1 right so the language is clear the language the l it's clear and now what we are saying that you start with a with an uh with a dfa initially which is epsilon so this was the first step right so you have q and t both are epsilon and then you have uh just there is one state so you have transitions to itself 0 and 1 okay now q is separable so q is this it is separable 
with respect to t because you just have only uh, one state here and it is also closed why it is closed because starting from epsilon epsilon dot 0 there exists some state which is in q uh, that is equivalent right so let's say you have why it is closed because epsilon dot 0 is p equivalent to epsilon and epsilon dot 1 is p equivalent to epsilon right because it is t equivalent because t has only epsilon t has only epsilon neither this belongs to l this also does not belong to l just one does not belong to l this also does not belong to l right hence this strings this is t equivalent to this this is t equivalent to this and hence q is closed with respect to t clear so what was the definition of closure for every small q belonging to capital q for all so it was like this right so for all q belonging to q for all a belonging to sigma there exists some q prime belonging to t such that q a is t equivalent to q prime correct so this was the definition so hence this q and this t uh, given this q and this t we can see that q is separable and closed with respect to capital t okay so now what should be the next step what do you do what is the next step in the algorithm yeah you would first so then there is a there is an equivalence query the learner would make right so the next step is equivalence query and the teacher gives a counter example suppose the counter example is 1 0 0 okay so suppose this is a counter example now this belongs to l but this is not accepted by this hypothesis automaton which is this one Hence, this is a counter example. Now, you have to find out, you have to expand the Q and the T, right? So, what happens? So, you say delta star epsilon comma 1 is epsilon, right? And you see that epsilon dot 0, 0 does not belong to L but 100 zero zero belongs to l right hence what happens is that epsilon and epsilon dot one are distinguished by zero zero so my new t prime is going to be t union 0 0 and my q prime is going to be so so what was the thing like so how did we find the so we are trying to so let's revisit so we are trying to find some so what did we do so we added the qi right because qi was incorrect so we added the string q prime equal to q union qi minus 1 wi right so we added the string qi minus 1 wi because this was not see qi minus 1 wi and qi are distinguished by wi plus 1 to wm so in t with t prime we added this and q prime we added q minus q i minus 1 and w i q i minus 1 w i so this is the string we added to q to get q prime and this is the string which was distinguishing right it is distinguished q i minus 1 w i and q i are distinguished by this right and we added this string to t to get t prime 
right so as we said that epsilon is correct epsilon is correct right but now if you see delta star delta star epsilon comma 1 so this is my qi minus this is my qi minus 1 this is correct right what is qi this is the delta star of epsilon comma 1 right because this string is 1 0 so delta star epsilon comma 1 but this is also epsilon so my qi is also epsilon right and then what is the wi plus 1 to wm that is this 0 0 wi plus 1 to wm part which was distinguishing distinguishing qi and qi minus 1 wi so what is qi here qi as we saw it is epsilon what is qi minus 1 wi this is epsilon dot 1 and this is being distinguished by wi plus 1 to wm so this part is wi plus 1 to wm right so now what do we do we add what do we add here we add epsilon dot 1 which is the same as 1 and here we are adding this thing Zero zero, right? So now, what do we get? So you have epsilon. This is one state, and you have another state which is one. Okay, and now we have to sort of find out the transitions. Okay, so how do I find out the transitions? Now, is epsilon dot a T prime equivalent to epsilon or sorry not a I we have the one or epsilon dot one T prime equivalent to one. We ask this question. Now what do you think? It is T prime equivalent to one. Why is it the case? Why is it not? T prime equivalent to epsilon because zero zero can distinguish it, right? Similarly, you can also say what about epsilon dot zero? You can show that it is T prime equivalent to epsilon. Okay, so here you have one, here you have zero, right? From the closure, the definition of closure, right? We just saw that for all Q, for all A, there exists a Q prime such that Q prime is T equivalent to some existing element in Q, right? So this is what you get. And similarly, what about one dot zero? It is T equivalent to this, or one dot one is. T equivalent to one. Which one? Oh, sorry, one dot zero here. And then similarly, one dot one T equivalent to this, or one dot one is T equivalent to. So you have only zero zero and epsilon, of course. In T prime, right? So T prime has what are the elements of T prime? This is so T prime equal to now epsilon and zero zero. so of course here you see that 0 0 can distinguish this right 1.0 and no it cannot actually 
but here here zero zero can distinguish in fact so this one i'm talking about this one zero zero can distinguish why because one zero zero belongs to the language one followed by three zeros is not in the language right whereas here these two one zero and epsilon are not t prime distinguishable right so i'm just writing t prime here but okay right right so then what happens so 1.0 should go to epsilon this is like this what about 1.1 so again 1.1 here you see that 0 0 can indeed distinguish 1.1 and epsilon but 0 0 here does not distinguish right so 1.1 you should have here okay one dot one is equivalent to t equivalent to or t prime equivalent to one right and so you have a self loop so now you get an automaton such that now this so let me call the q to be q prime itself so q equal to q prime t equal to t prime okay so now my i just say my q is this new set of strings that i got t is the new set of string test set that i got and you see that what we found by that lemma that q is separable and closed with respect to capital t here the epsilon state no the epsilon state is not an accepting state why because epsilon does not belong to that language one also does not belong to that language any string which belongs to the language so if you have any q any q that belongs to q and q belongs to l should be an accepting state is accepting okay but since neither epsilon nor one belongs to the language l none of them is accepting okay q is separable and closed with respect to t so now what do we do so we have this another automaton this is separable and so q is separable with respect to t and q is also closed with respect to t so now what should be the next step so you will again ask for an equivalence query correct so we ask for an equivalence query again so let's say i have this automaton and my q equal to epsilon and 1 my t equal to epsilon and 0 0 now you ask for the again you ask for an equivalence query okay you ask for an equivalence query and again you can consider 100 zero zero as a counter example right you can consider 100 zero zero as a counter example now what do you do so suppose you consider delta star epsilon 1 0 right so where do you go you get to epsilon right and you see that epsilon dot 0 does not belong to l but 100 zero zero belongs to l right correct so one the state whereas delta star 
epsilon comma 1 you go to the state 1 okay and if you consider 1 dot 0 0 this belongs to l as well as uh, of course 1 0 0 belongs to l so this is correct so uh, the state q i minus 1 here the state q i minus 1 which is this one this is correct but the state q i which is epsilon is incorrect okay so now then what happens is you have <clears throat> you have uh, so the state that is uh, that you were reaching by reading one zero that is incorrect and so epsilon and your q i minus one right so this is my q i so let's try to write this is my q i and q i minus one w i this is one dot zero correct so this is my q i minus one and this is my qi. So qi minus 1 wi is 1 dot 0. Right? So 1 dot 0 and 1. Right? So qi and qi minus 1 wi. So 1 is if 1 is uh, 1 dot 0. So which is this one. And qi which is epsilon are distinguished by stream 0. Okay? Correct? So, now my new Q prime will be Q union 1, 0. So, essentially this thing. And my new T prime will be T union 0. So, this is epsilon 0, 0, 0, and this is epsilon 1, 1, 0. Okay. So let me move it. Okay. So now, given this, let's try to draw this i mean i think we can just it's not very difficult to see that this is indeed going to be the case and now if you talk about uh, the following that let's say i mean you can of course see all this that uh, and you can have let's say a zero here you can see epsilon and i and i'm going to call the new t prime so let's say I'm going to call the new t prime t equal to t, t prime and q equal to q prime. Okay. So I'm just going to, I'm not going to use t prime q prime. I'm always going to use the t and q. And so that's why I just uh, use the same symbols. Yeah. Okay. So epsilon dot zero, you can prove that this is indeed t equivalent to epsilon. So you can show just the way we were doing it earlier this is t equivalent to epsilon you can show that epsilon dot one is t equivalent to one and uh, now you can also show that one dot zero is t equivalent to one zero this these things you can show now what about one dot one let's say okay so let's say one dot one. Let's look at this. So is it T equivalent to epsilon or one dot one T equivalent to one or one dot one T equivalent to one zero? So what do you think is the case? Huh? One dot one, you think it is T equivalent to one? The answer is no. Why? 
because zero can distinguish them right because if you append zero then you get one one zero and one zero so this belongs to l this does not belong to l correct so now you, your set indeed has a zero also right what about 1.1 and 10 what about this one zero zero can distinguish zero zero can distinguish clear what about this one a zero can distinguish uh zero zero can distinguish here okay so none of them are t equivalent to 1.1 if that is the case so you have to close it correct so we saw the second lemma that you can you can if q is separable if it is if q is suppose q is not closed you can add some finitely many such more sets uh more strings uh in order to get the resultant set closed with respect to t so we are going to add a one here and you get us new state or string one one okay and then you have to do similarly so suppose let's do this for 100 so suppose i now consider uh 10 okay so this is fine uh let's say now i consider 100 so is it t equivalent to this 100 is T equivalent to uh one one zero zero is t equivalent to one zero or one zero zero is t equivalent to one one. Which of them is true, right? So now you see that this one epsilon distinguishes. This one epsilon distinguishes. this one epsilon distinguishes and this one also epsilon distinguishes clear so you need another string here correct so now you add a zero you get 100 now you note that this 100 belongs to the language l so this is going to be my final state clear so this state 100 belongs to a final state and you continue this until this state of strings you keep adding strings to q until what until your set q so keep adding strings and expand q until q is closed with respect to t okay clear and once it becomes closed then what do you do you would perform again an equivalence query right so you do this so once it is closed then once closed again perform an equivalence query if you follow the full procedure like if you do the whole closure this time you will find that a teacher in fact responds yes and the automaton that you would come up with is in fact this one so how many states does it have can you count Huh? Eight states, right? So there are eight states. Is it the case that this is the minimal DFA accepting the language L? Is it 
the minimal DFA accepting L. What was L? Third letter from the end is a one. Right? And we saw this example when we did the subset, lower bound of subset construction that you need, there doesn't exist any automaton with less than eight states which can accept this language. Right? So this is indeed the minimal DFA accepting the language. Okay. So you have to like, it's not too difficult, but you have to be a bit familiar with uh, these things in order to like uh, do it yourself. Okay. So any question before we move to the next topic, but maybe uh, what I would like you to do is to also check the complexity of this algorithm. Complexity of the algorithm. So what do I mean by that? How many equivalence queries and how many membership queries? Okay, do you need? And then you have that algorithm and how many steps are there in that algorithm? Assume that the teacher, assume that the teacher here works as an oracle. So you are giving and you are making an oracle query. You understand what an oracle is? Sorry? Yeah, exactly. So the teacher gives you a counter example. You don't know how to produce the counter example, but assume that the teacher always gives you the gives you a counter example of uh, the smallest length. I mean, or it's not exactly necessary, or let's say for this process to be fast, uh, gives a counter example of the smallest length in constant time. And also, the answer to these, like teacher answers in constant time. Okay, so these assumptions you can have again as you. Right? Now, here you will also suppose this complexity will also depend on the size of the size of the largest counter example. The complexity depends on the size of the largest counter example. Okay, why is it so? In order to find that QI, which is incorrect, which is incorrect, right? Because epsilon was correct, QM incorrect. So you can do a binary search here to find the QI which is incorrect, right? And what was M? M was the length of the counter example. Okay. Okay. And uh, so you can figure out with all these things, all these parameters, how many steps are needed for that algorithm to run. And you will see that it's a polynomial time algorithm. Right? So this I would give you as a homework exercise. Okay. So this you have to tell me in the next lecture. 
So what is the complexity? That's all. Okay. Now, uh, any question? Okay. So maybe I'll just say a few couple of other things. So this is a very active area of research. Like, so because sometimes what happens that you don't know the exact model. You don't know the exact model, but you know, for example, like what this is, uh, what this system is producing. You can observe some strings that are produced by the system, by executing the system. And you'd like to construct the model of the system, right? It's a very pertinent and a valid question. You may not know the exact model, but you can see only the execution of the model and it produces some strings and you, you just want to construct the model, which is the automaton, right? And in reality, you may not also have such a nice teacher. There is an oracle who knows everything, correct? In reality, that may not exist. So you may not be able to actually ask these equivalence queries, right? So when those equivalence queries are not present in exact form, what kind of things can you do you can, so that you can still learn this, right? So can you replace the equivalence query with some other membership queries and things like, things like that, okay? And uh, so this is, these are the kind of theoretical questions one can ask. And here we are only looking at learning of deterministic finite automaton. Right, so it's it's also there are. Uh, this is also called an active learning, uh, active learning of DFA, and there are other kind of learning which is also called a passive learning, which we are not going to look at in this uh, in this course. But passive learning is about like you have a set of examples and counter examples, right? So you say that these are the words which are there in the language and these are the words which are not there in the language, right? So you are given set of words, some set of words, let's say, uh, um, I will call it, let's say, A, such that A is a subset of L and then you are given some B such that for all W belonging to B, you have W does not belong to L, right? So a set of examples and a set of counter examples, examples and counter examples. And in passive learning, what you do, you would like to learn the automaton from your examples and counter examples. So there are other algorithms for that. And it's not only, so the other area of research is like, well, I may not only be doing this learning only for the simple case of simple DFA, but there may be other complicated automata, right? Which uh, maybe we'll see some of them hopefully in this uh, course, but there are several other kinds of complicated automata, like automata with counters and maybe automata with infinite alphabet and so on and so forth. So how can you do active learning for those kind of automata as well, okay? And if you, so this is like an exact learning. So you get to learn the automaton exactly, exact learning. But in case you cannot do an exact learning, can you do some kind of an, instead of L, can you run, can you learn an L prime such that let's say L prime is a superset of L, okay? If you cannot do that and uh, exactly learn uh, an automaton for, L, can you learn it for some L prime, which is a superset, and what kind of complexity? Can you do that in polynomial time? Okay. So this kind of things. And also, see, this is very much dependent. All this characterization, the learning is very much dependent on a myhill neurot characterization. Right? It's There is a myhill neurot characterization. Now, what happens if you are learn, trying to learn this for a class of automaton where there doesn't exist a myhill neurot characterization, can you still uh, do some kind of learning, right? So then all these questions are very important and how do you solve them? And these are very important like uh, research questions and, uh, and uh, area of research in itself. Okay, so 
with this we will uh, end uh, this part and now we will move to something called another characterization of regular languages right another characterization characterization which is called a logical characterization again this is another very important part of automated theory logical characterization of uh, regular languages right i mean uh, in many some of the old books you will also find old texts that the people also call them rational languages right so what is the idea uh okay so the idea is the following that you are doing a logic course right you are doing a logic course now so mathematical logic can be used to express a set of words express a set of words so this is the idea so essentially there can be a logical formula let's say i call it phi okay and there are a set of words right there are a set of words which will satisfy this formula so you have for example whenever you talk about a formula phi and whenever you talk about the satisfaction of a logical formula phi what comes to your mind in the first place what satis sorry i don't right so you say that there is some phi here correct so there is a phi which is a formula and then it is satisfied by something so what is this this is called a this is a model that's what you said so there is a model right so whenever you are talking about like there is a logical formula there is a model which satisfies this in our case we are going to have word models okay it's word models but for simplicity let's i mean i'll we'll discuss what a model is or it's also called a structure so have you studied this in your logic course already a model and a structure no not yet okay so uh so uh we are going to talk about this word models or word structures which satisfy this formula but for simplicity let's for now let's call them words okay so it's a set of words which satisfy the formula phi and the set of words so this is a set of words and the set of words essentially it's a language right so the idea is that a logical formula a logical formula defines a language we'll see this in a bit more uh precise form it's not just an arbitrary formula but we are going to call this a sentence a sentence which is a particular kind of logical formula in which there are no free variables all the variables are bound so do you know what is a free variable and what is a bound variable have you sorry sentential logic yeah so you saw that already ah sure so you have the free variables and the bound variables so if a formula doesn't have any free variable then you call it a sentence and a sentence essentially corresponds to a language right so let me give you an example suppose uh my formula says that suppose my formula says expresses something like this the second letter in a word should be a b should be a b okay the character b right so this 
this is a property and suppose i can describe this property using some logical formula sign now what are the set of words which will accept which will satisfy this property phi maybe b b b b a a b a b a etc and which are the words which will not satisfy maybe b a a a a a a b a b etc right they don't satisfy okay this these words or this uh words don't satisfy phi whereas the ones which are here they satisfy the uh formula phi now so we are going to discuss about identify so this is this in the next half an hour we are going to talk about discuss the following identify a logical specification framework to capture precisely the regular languages right so we are talking about a logical specification framework to capture precisely to capture precisely this so what does it mean that means that i would like to talk about some logic where the formulas there or the sentences there will correspond to a regular language so if i have a phi if i have a phi then it will correspond to a regular language l or i would say l of phi equal to l so you intuitively understand what is meant by l of phi it is a set of words which satis satisfies set of words that satisfy the formula phi that is what i am calling l of phi right and it corresponds to some regular language l okay and given l it's a characterization so given l i can actually construct a phi so it is a both way thing because it's a characterization right given l i can construct a phi such that the language for the phi is the same as this given the language the regular language l right i want to do it both ways okay so now let's try to formulate the logic okay so i think this is kind of easy and that's why i just wrote them down you can go we can go through it quite fast so the logic formula will be interpreted over the positions of the words right so for example i say second position the second letter the letter at the second position should be a b right so the logic formula will be interpreted over the positions of the words so it will have variables we will use variables in the logic formula such as x y z that can assume values which are positions so x can x is a variable which denotes some position y is a variable which denotes some position z is a variable which denotes some position clear and we have predicates of the form p a x for all a belonging to sigma it's a unary predicate right what does it denote it denotes that the letter at position x is an a so this is the interpretation of this unary predicate p a of x that the letter at position x is an a we have a binary predicate so we are defining the syntax of the logic we are talking about the syntax of the logic which will capture the regular languages regular correct we have a binary predicate x less than y which means that the position x appears before position y in that word correct good and we have logical connectives we have logical connectives so you know not or and you can define implication by implication you have seen all this right in propositional logic 
Now we also have quantifiers, like there exists some x or all x, which are the variables. So what kind of logic are you getting? First order logic. You are getting first order logic. So suppose I give you this formula. There exists an x, there exists a y, such that pb of x and pb of y and next of x, y. What does it mean? So there exists a position X, there exists a position of Y, such that at position X, the letter is B, at position Y, the letter is B, and Y is the next position, the position which appears next to the position X. Clear? And what I'm saying that, see, in our set of predicates, this next predicate doesn't appear, correct? because my predicate has only less than, and I have this, this is the binary predicate, and these were the unary predicates. Next is a binary predicate, next of x, y. So I'm saying this is a derived predicate because you can define it in this way, that x is less than y, and there doesn't exist any z for which x is less, such that z is in between x and y. So you can define the next of x, y, correct? So you can use such derived predicates. Right? So now, can you define an automaton here, which accepts the same, uh, accepts this, this, uh, the set of words, which will be satisfying this, this, this formula, right? It's very easy. There is nothing. I mean, I can at least draw an NFA for sure, easily. So I can draw an NFA, let's say, I have a comma b, then I have a b here, I go there, then there is another b, successive two consecutive b's, correct? And once you have that, you reach a final state. You can read any number of letters. So all we are talking about, it accepts all those set of words which have a pair of consecutive b's. Good. Now, suppose I give you another automaton, suppose I give you uh, another uh, automaton. So I'm giving you an automaton, which is of the following form. So you have this and you have a comma B, you go there, you read a comma B, so your sigma is again a comma B. And suppose this is my final state, right? The initial state itself is final. So the language has epsilon. So what does it denote? Sorry? Yes, very good. So these accept strings of even length. Right? Now, my question is, can you try to, given this sort of, you saw an example here. Correct. Right. Can you try to give such a logical formula? Right. Which accepts this language. Sorry. Right, so I'm just now trying to sort of come up with a logical formula which will accept the strings, the logical formula which will be satisfied by the strings that are accepted by this automaton. How do you do this?
Okay, so I'll give you try to intuitively argue that whatever we have seen so far, that this kind of quantifications, that there exists x, not all x, where x denotes a particular position, you cannot express, you cannot express the language with this first order logic on words. So I'll give you an intuitive reason why it cannot be done. Because suppose you have some x, y, z, etc. You are some variable, some finite number of variables you are using in your formula. Suppose there is a formula you have corresponding to this language of even length words. So, and that formula will have some finite number of variables. True. Now, what does each variable denote? Each variable denotes a position. Each variable denotes a position. And you want to talk about even length words. You want to talk about even length words, right? Maybe you might want to talk about like this X uh, is a position which has some A or which has some B and then it has to appear in uh, appear at an even position at an even position and so on and so forth, right? But somehow you need to capture the fact that there can be this, this word which will have several positions and many of these, like there can be unbounded number of positions which are uh, the even positions, right? You do not know a priori how many even positions will be there, right? So, you, so the idea is that uh, because of that, you cannot capture this particular language with finitely many such variables. You might want to say that uh, there exists some x here, then there exists some y here, then there exists some z here, right? And maybe uh, here there is, this is your, you can define something like a first of some, uh, uh, first, suppose this is the first position, right? So suppose you want to say that this is the first position, which is like, let's say, uh, your variable, let's say, is u. So first of u, so it means that the first position. So we can define this. How do you define the first of, first of u? It's like, uh, for, all z, correct, uh, u is uh, less than z or u equal to z. So the equality always comes for free, okay? Or you can say that uh, there exists, it is not the case that there exists a z such that z is less than u, right? So this is the definition of first of first of u. So it's a derived predicate. You can always get that, right? So all I'm saying is that if you have some variables that you want to use to define this even length strings, so you want to say that, okay, I have an X here at an even position. Then I have a Y here at again the even position, then a Z at the even position, right? You can only talk about some finite, some some finite length string because your x, y, z will refer to some specific position, but you do not know a priori what is the length of that even length string which you can have in this particular uh, language. There is no a priori bound on the set of strings which satisfy uh, the, this, this property, right? Hence, intuitively, you cannot capture this language with finitely many such variables. 
so in order to do that what do we need is what we call state variables right so what is a state variables we are going to define this with capital x y z so on and so forth and <clears throat> a state variable is a subset of the positions it's a subset of the positions and now with whatever we saw we are also going to allow like a for all of the set variables or there exist such set variables clear right so now you can talk about like i can say i have such a set x and i can say that maybe there exists some capital x there exists some small y such that y belongs to capital x okay and we are also going to denote this as x of y is the same that y belongs to x we are going to denote this as x of y okay now given this how do you define given this how do you define the specific language that we said that is the strings of even length okay <clears throat> right so again why do we need this like because if you had suppose in the first order logic if you had k variables you can capture we can capture we can capture k positions correct if you have k variables you can capture k positions right but a string which satisfies this property string of even length that may not be bounded by some k or 2k or some function of uh, k right it may be just an unbounded it may be of unbounded length you do not know apparently what is the length okay so we say hence we cannot expect that like this k variables are going to capture uh, all such positions right uh, right uh, um which you might need in order to capture these strings this set of strings of even length so now that's why we are introducing this set variables and we claim that with this you can indeed express this language right so the question is how do you do this okay so let me write it down it may not be that easy to think uh, to come up with this at least when you are just looking at seeing this for the first time so suppose i say that there exists an x so i'm talking about a set x and what is the intuition of this set x so i'm going to capture the set of even positions okay i'm going to capture the set of even positions right and now suppose you have a word which is of the form a b b a a b a so this is of length 7 so let me add another a maybe so length 8 okay so this is a string of even length so this is the first position correct so i want to say that a does not belong to x so or or rather position 1 does not belong to x this belongs to x this does not belong to x this belongs to x and so on and so forth and the last one should belong to x the first one does not belong to x the last one belongs to x and they alternate right if this one belongs to x if this one belongs to x then the next one should not belong to this set x if this one belongs to x then the next one should belong to x and so on right so this is what we want to express correct so now 
once i have said this maybe now you can do it so i'll just do this quickly for you so there exists x there exists some small x such that first of x so we saw how to get this derived predicate first of x and it is not the case that small x belong to capital small x belongs to capital x and there exists some x such that last of x i can also define the last similar to first clear and x of x and what for all y z such that next of y z right we saw the next also as a derived predicate implies either of the two if it is if y is in capital x then z should not be in capital x or vice versa right so it implies that let's say uh, x of y and not of x of z or not of x of y and x of z okay sorry yeah yeah sure you were right you were right or not of x of y and x of z so just be careful about the parenthesis so maybe some of them it's not properly balanced but yeah i think it's okay right is it clear what we do okay ha huh? it's not any subset of integers but it's so what is the domain here so i have not really formally defined uh the notion of the model yet we are going to talk about it so what is the domain here the domain is the state of positions the domain is the state of positions and x is a subset of this domain which is the state of positions okay so if you consider any particular word model so i am saying that given a word w whether w satisfy this phi right so i am calling this phi whether w satisfy phi or not right so this w will have a set of positions correct it's a word now this x will be a subset of the set of positions which appear in w okay clear now we will formally okay so one small thing does it still capture the entire language that we were kind of talking about strings of even length does it still capture or there is still something missing it's a very corner case it's a corner case what is the corner case empty string okay so empty string is of even length it's of length zero it's even length but you see that an empty string will not satisfy this particular formula why because you are saying that there exists a set and there exists an element x right such that x belongs to this capital x right what are the set of positions for an empty string the set of position the domain for an empty string is empty right the domain for an empty string is empty so how are you going to capture that empty string it is not the case that there exists an x sorry such that first of x 
ओके सो एप्साइलन द एम्प्टी स्ट्रिंग सेटिस्फाई दिस क्लियर इट इज नॉट द केस दैट देयर एग्जिस्ट्स एन एक्स सच दैट फर्स्ट ऑफ एक्स सो इफ द फर्स्ट पोजीशन इटसेल्फ डजंट अपीयर दैट मींस ओनली द एम्प्टी स्ट्रिंग कैन सेटिस्फाई दिस राइट so i call this formula let's say psi so that means the formula for this set of even length words it's phi or psi clear question clear okay so the domain the set of positions for an empty string is empty okay good so and and how do you define last of x i mean i think it's just very easy but uh we can say it's not the case that there exists a z there exists a z such that x is less than z okay okay so now let's define this logic that we get it's no longer a first order logic because first order logic has only this thing up to here what you see true false not a phi phi and conjunction disjunction implication by implication and you have a set of propositions or set of rather predicates right so this is a unary predicate this is a binary predicate so what is pa pa of x again at position x the label the letter is a and here you have the first order quantifiers universal quantifier existential quantifier and here you have quantifiers on the sets now when you have quantify quantification over the set variables these are called monadic predicates okay like these are the uh these are the monadic predicates okay so in general second order logic allows quantification over predicates second order logic allows quantification over predicates which can be arbitrary arbitrary relations so suppose you consider a relation r huh so it can have x1 x2 some xm okay now i can say for all such r there exists such an r etc so this is what second order logic allows you to do but what is monadic second order logic it's a subset of second order logic where r has r has arity 1 what is arity the number of arguments that you take correct so you, your r has r can only take your r can take only an x so you can have for all r there exists r but it's a unary predicate so what is a unary predicate it's a set a unary predicate is nothing but a set a unary relation is nothing but a set clear okay so as long as you have quantification over the set variables you call it a monadic second order logic or mso if you allow arbitrary quantification over arbitrary sets you call it a second order logic da okay so we discussed uh, so can you tell me what is a zero ary predicate yeah but what is this x where is this x coming from yeah you don't have any variable it's a zero ary predicate right okay so think over this and uh, let me know 
like uh, what is the zero value predicate it will you are you are close to it but uh, just give it a thought okay now we'll go back to a bit of logic so have you so this is what the what is it called it's called the syntax of the logic what we saw it's a syntax of the logic have you seen syntax of a logic right and what else comes with a logic other than the syntax have you seen this word called semantics huh sorry you haven't seen the word semantics okay so the semantics of a logic essentially means so this is the syntax it's like how you are going to express the formula the semantics is how you are going to interpret the formula it talks about how you are going to interpret like when it is true on what kind of structures it is going to be true on a graph on a tree on a on 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 a word or for what kind of th things it's going to be true that is what essentially is defined by the semantics it gives you an interpretation for this logical syntax okay so the semantics is usually defined with the help of a structure or a model okay now we'll see what is a structure so again it's a bunch of definitions so i just put it up here so a structure is a tuple of this form where there is a domain so it's a tuple of three things where there is a domain a so for example in our case in the word model so a structure is also called a model the same thing okay in the case of word model word model so what is the domain the domain is a set of positions okay so this is a, the domain is a set of positions in a word model a word model is you can think of this as a single word that is right along with some extra information extra other things which we are going to see now so the set of positions that comes with a word so that defines the domain what is a signature a signature and and we also refer to the domain as sometimes as universe okay and you call it like uh, the domain or the universe they are the same okay so as i say it is a set of positions and what is signature a signature has two things is and there is a set s and there is ar which is a arity okay so it's s is a set of functions functions symbols actually it's bit incorrect s is a set of function symbols then you have relation symbols and ar is an arity so arity you understand like for the function symbols and for the relation symbols how many arguments does it take so that is the arity function gives you for each function and relation okay and usually if you whenever you talk about an algebra so the algebra will have a signature which is this sigma signature which with only function symbols so that is an algebra okay and i here is an interpretation okay so what is i i is an interpretation and the domain of i is this sigma is the signature is the domain and so if c is a constant symbol what is a constant symbol it's a relation symbol with arity 0 c is a constant symbol it's a relation symbol with arity 0 then the interpretation that you give to that constant symbol is actually a constant from your universe so these are all so it might be a bit confusing in the beginning but the whole idea is that a signature has a bunch of symbols a signature as a bunch of symbols and i is an interpretation it gives a meaning to the symbols 
if it is a constant symbol which means it's a zero ID signature it actually gives a meaning from the domain so it associates it gives it a value it associates that constant symbol with an element in the domain okay if it's a relation symbol then it relates it with some relation that you have in your logic correct so if it is a, if it is an nre function symbol then it relates the interpretation actually gives it a meaning it's a symbol it is giving a meaning that means that the symbol will now denote an nre function if it is an nre relational symbol then the interpretation gives it an actual nre relation right so for example suppose if i say if i use a war some some operation which looks like this okay now let me say that a this thing or rather it's a binary let's say it's a binary thing it actually means a plus b right by plus we mean addition so this i of this thing it says that we should add we should add right so it gives it such an interpretation right and often we would use actually just the plus a b for addition so often we don't care about we don't write the interpretation specifically explicitly okay so again a structure it comes with three things there is a domain there is a set of symbols uh, or it's called the signature which which is a set of symbols with an identity function and then there is an, there is an interpretation so whenever you have a logic you have a syntax the syntax of the logic then you have a model which will satisfy that logical formula and that model or structure will have these different things right this is very important like it's a very fundamental thing that one should know when you are talking about uh, logic and then we are going to talk about uh, the satisfaction and so on right it's just it's very fundamental there is nothing which is very difficult but it's it's extremely fundamental okay so suppose you have like i'll just uh talk about this free and bound variables so suppose you have such a word which is w a b b a b a now consider a formula of this x1 x2 and a capital x1 so this is a set variable and these two are individual variables and what does it say that at position x1 the letter is b at position x2 the letter is again b and for all y which are in between x1 and x2 the the label is a the letter is a okay for all y so which are in the set x1 okay so this x1 for all those positions which are in this set correct and uh, this between these two positions x1 and small x1 small x2 for all such y which are in this set the label is a clear and uh, suppose phi2 is of this form uh, there exists x there exists y and pa of x so x position x has a label a position y has a label a and y is immediately after x correct now you are given this word w and we are asking this question does w satisfy this formula so you have two corresponding to x1 three corresponding to x2 and this set corresponding to capital x1 okay right? indeed it satisfies i am saying that this word model satisfies this thing so here what are the three variables you see that small x1 small x2 and capital x1 these are all the free variables they are not quantified whereas y is a bound variable because here this y is bound by this quantifier okay right so whenever you have the free variables and you want to 
check for satisfaction, you have to instantiate the free variables, right? So whether this W satisfy this phi one, you have to instantiate, you have to put some values for the free variables and check for their satisfaction. Whereas if you, and similarly here, the W does not satisfy for this instantiation. Why? You consider three and six. So you have three here, six is here. Now clearly these two, PB of X1, PB of position three is true, but PB of position six is false. So it does not satisfy any of this, right? So this is in conjunction. This has to be true, this has to be true, and also this has to be true. So this is not satisfied, this part, right? Why is this true? Two, three, one, two, four. Two is here, three is here. And for all positions, which are strictly between these two. So there is nothing which is strictly in between. Hence, this satisfies this clear. And W does not satisfy phi two. This by what is, why I'm putting this angular bracket here? The angular bracket denotes the word model. So W is the word, W is the word model or the structure, okay? So in order to denote the model, I'm putting this angular bracket, okay? It's not just the word, it comes with several other things. It has a domain, it has the signature, it has the interpretation. So all these things are there in this word model. And this model does not satisfy the formula phi two. And whenever you are talking about the formula phi two, you see that there are no free variables in phi two. So x, y, x and y, these are the bound variables, right? Both of everything is bound here. It can be evaluated directly on the word model. You don't need to instantiate any of the variables because the variables are not free. Okay. So what is this? There exists X, there exists Y. So does there exist any contiguous or successive positions with A labels? No, there isn't any. Right, so hence W, the word model does not satisfy phi. Okay, and a formula with a with no free variables is called a sentence. Formula with no free variables is called a sentence, and sentences can be interpreted directly on word models. We just saw that, and for a sentence phi, we can associate a language of words such that. It's a set of words such that the word model satisfies the formula phi. Okay. Now this formula phi, what kind of formula is this? What kind of formula? This is a monadic second order logic formula, MSO formula, MSO sentence. The language, this L of phi, where phi is MSO, such a language is called MSO definable. Monadic second order logic definable language. Okay, and the big theorem that we are going to see in the next lecture is a language L is regular if and only if L is MSO definable. Okay. It's a very big theorem. Uh, it was proposed by, I think, independently, uh, some people called Bushi. I don't exactly recall, but maybe it got tracked and brought from various places in the world. Tracked and brought. It's called Bushi L got tracked and brought theorem, right? So these are very different things. You have a regular language, which is an automaton. And here you were talking about a logical formula. Right? It's a very different entities altogether. And you are saying that the language which is captured by an MSO formula, it has to be a regular language and vice versa. Right? So this is the thing. So Bushi, Elgot, and Tracton got showed the equivalence of regular languages and MSO definable. Definability a language is regular if and only if it is MSO. Definable. So we'll start with this in the next lecture.
go to this proof. So, any question before we end today? No. Okay. So then, let's uh, stop the screen.